has changed. Visible and virtual worlds are blending. This is digital transformation. It creates unlimited opportunity, disrupting business as usual. A transportation provider who owns no cars. A hotel chain who owns no hotels. Through this disruption, winners and losers emerge, and technology can be a catalyst for success or failure. Winners will use technology to drive outcomes and focus on what is at the core of digital transformation, data. But the world of data is changing. Today, data is connected, open, and fluid. To drive measurable outcomes, you need the power to capture data from the edge. Outcomes include reducing energy consumption and optimizing maintenance, saving one customer over $10 million every two years in fuel efficiency. Providing differentiated analytics capabilities to a leader in connected car technology. Estimating tens of millions in savings from unscheduled downtime while improving train service. The journey to digital transformation requires a solution that can manage data end to end. A solution that takes full advantage of new and emerging data types and technologies without disturbing how you run your business day to day. A solution that allows you to move beyond big data to transformation. That solution is Pentaho. Please welcome to the stage, Pentaho Senior Vice President, Customer Success, and Chief Solution Architect, Anthony DeShazer. Welcome to Pentaho World 2017! Are you excited to be here? Okay, you can talk back to me here. I'm a little, in, uh, a little interactive, but are you excited to be here? Yes. Come on, one more time. Are you excited to be here? Oh, welcome to all of you to Bentaho World 2017. I would like to thank our sponsors, MAPR, Melissa, IT Novum, for helping us put on this wonderful event where we can collaborate and hear from you, our customers. I'd like to also thank all of you from traveling from wherever you came to wonderful Orlando. We have 29 different countries represented. We have 450 attendees. Most of you are technical, so we can geek out together. That was a joke, you could have laughed. So we're excited to be here today. We thank each and every one of you for coming, taking time out of your day, a time out of your week, to come share your experiences with us. We're excited to hear from you, to learn from you what's needed in this next wave of innovation. We're also here to celebrate 13 years 13 years this month, Pentaho was founded. We started with this concept of having an embeddable, extendable data analytic platform. The founding principles that were, were simply that the solution had to mold to the problem versus forcing you to mold to the solution. We needed to provide a, a way for you to get the value out of your data in the most impactful place possible. That's at the point of impact while you're working in process. Throughout the years, we've gone through many transformations, many changes with the technology. But that core principle has been our driving and centering force. Rumor has it, you know, we all have urban legends, but there's an urban legend about Pentaho that our founding CEO had a wonderful conversation with some of our architects sketched some things on the back of a napkin about this thing called Hadoop at the time, some four or five years ago. And within a couple of days, building upon that extendable platform, we had a working prototype of how Pentaho can integrate with Hadoop. With Pentaho 7.0, we built upon that with the adaptive execution layer, which then allows us to, to extend that concept to adapt or, or to be ready for whatever the next wave of computation is out there. It's that focus on providing the extendable solution that brings us here. Throughout the 13 years, I've been blessed to be here for 12. So I've seen a lot of things. 
I've seen a lot of people come and go. I've seen a lot of customers. The, 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 the whole thing that's funny about Pentaho is I have the reputation of being the, the, uh, the, the escalation guy. So I get to meet all of you, even at your point of pain. And through each of those interactions, we've learned something. We've learned that the problem is no longer data. Big data is no longer a big problem. This next problem is how do you transform your company? How do you become that internal disruptor that leads the change so that your company can, in, can disrupt your entire industry? How do we help you transform? Transform the way you look at data, the way you think about data. Transform the way you do analytics. So it's no longer just looking at dashboards, but we have analytics guided by artificial intelligence, machine learning, predictive models. How do we help you transform to being a data culture where everyone values the data you have and everyone has access to the right data? How do we help you transform to just processing data from traditional data sources to mastering even the unknown data sources at the edge of your computing capability? How do we do that for you? How do we help you do that? That's what today, tomorrow is all about. It's to share the thoughts we have, the plans we have, to help you lead that transformation. Are you excited? Yes. I'm gonna ask that again. Are you excited? Yes. Are you ready to take a leadership position in this transformation? Okay, I don't know, I don't know. I think we may have to do that again. I'm gonna try that one more time. Are you ready to take a leadership position in this transformation? Yes. Are you ready to be disruptive? Great. So it's with that same focus on doing something new and innovative that we've launched and introduced Hitachi Ventara. We took three entities, Hitachi Data Systems, Hitachi Insight Group, and Pentaho, and formed this new, massive innovation that will lead this next transformation. With that, let me introduce our President and Chief Operating Officer of Hitachi Ventara, Brian Householder. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Everyone got their coffee? Watched the World Series last night, 11 innings. Pedro was out in the bar, so I know at least some customers were out in the bar late at night as well. So as Anthony mentioned, at least, um, my name is Brian Householder. I'm the president and COO of Hitachi Ventara. Uh, I've been asked at least to give you a little bit more background about Hitachi and Hitachi Ventara. So a quick question for our customers of Pentaho or potential customers. How many of you are customers of Hitachi above and beyond what you do with Pentaho? Can I see a show of hands, please? And I'm going to at least cover up a few. All right, and how many outside of what Anthony just talked about have heard of Hitachi Ventara before? This is, again, no, no employees can actually answer this question. I see a few more. OK, great. So let me just at least give a quick update on Hitachi overall. And then I'm going to spend a little bit more time about Hitachi Ventara, our strategy, what we're doing. I had a chance to talk to a number of customers yesterday. Can a little talk about transformation a lot, because we at Hitachi have done a huge amount of transformation. Pentaho and how that fits is really key to our transformation as well. And so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. So Hitachi overall, um, obviously a $100 billion organization. We spend over $3 billion a year in R&D. Uh, we are an innovation and technology company at our core. So to give you an example of that, we have 120,000 patents just in terms of the technology innovation that Hitachi does. I didn't get the numbers right. It's 120,000. And so really, at our core, we are a technology and innovation company. And that's really what we focus on. That's really what we are looking to go do in terms of how we can actually provide value for you. Now, at Hitachi, we have an overall strategy, an overall vision called social innovation. So taking around that technology innovation that we do, we talk about social innovation. 
And really, how do we actually actually benefit both the businesses that we provide outcomes for, but then also, more importantly, how do we also help benefit society as well? And so we talk about this in terms of, you know, everyone's obviously focused on helping you achieve your bottom line objectives. How do we actually grow revenues? How do we actually then, you know, decrease cost, optimize cost, drive the bottom line? And that's very important. And the outcomes that we really are focused on are trying to help you as a customer do that. But then we have a second mission as well. How do we actually then go out there and do things that help benefit society as well? And so we call that our double bottom line. Really, how do we actually benefit both business and society? So you'll hear a lot about what we talk about in terms of better outcomes, better business, and better society. And it's really, it's really fun and exciting for all of us, including myself, in terms of being part of a mission of Hitachi overall. And so you'll see Hitachi Vintara, the Pentaho piece of that, how they all fit into helping Hitachi achieve its social innovation objectives. So let me just give you a quick background, a little bit more of a historical lesson around the journey we've had with Pentaho and give you a little bit better handle in terms of how Pentaho fits into this new Hitachi Ventara as well. So I've been with Hitachi over 14 years. Uh, I was actually brought in, I'm more of a software person, done software services, a number of other areas. A few of us were brought in to help Hitachi transform, and this was Hitachi Data Systems here 14 years ago. Mainly back then was an infrastructure company. Only about 20% of our revenue came from software and services and we were out there trying to help change that. And so we really had a strategy around how do we actually move beyond the infrastructure into becoming more of a data company. And that was something that we really had for the last 10, 15 years, been working on that overall strategy. So we made a number of acquisitions, we certainly changed a lot of our roadmaps, a lot more software, R&D, huge changes that we did. We're now, you know, at the time, uh, back in 2015, about 50% of our revenue came from software and services. That was great. But really, when we wanted to shift to become a data company, we knew we had a big hole in our overall strategy. And that's really where Pentaho fit into the overall mix. We had some amazing solutions that helped you know, drive and, and solve content solutions, some great software. But one of the biggest problems that we did not solve at the time was how do we actually help people with their analytics, with their big data challenges? How do we actually help them in terms of a lot of the structured data? How do you actually make sense of that? And so really when we started talking more and more with customers, we knew we needed to actually have that core foundational piece around data and analytics. And so certainly I was involved in this acquisition back in 2015, it's been over two years now. And one of the key things that we looked at, we looked at all of the analytics companies in the marketplace. So this gets into, if you look at the, you know, the desktop visualization solutions, all the different solutions out there. But really the biggest thing that we looked to go saw was really uh, the, the number one challenge that I run into in terms of talking with customers was really around how do they actually get to the data itself. And one thing that Hitachi is very good at, we're very good at large, complex problems. So if we start talking about the world that you have right now, it's not just a world of terabytes or even the world of petabytes. We have a number of customers that we're helping them manage exabytes and exabytes of data. And that's the challenge that we saw. And as we start talking about where the world is going to be here in the future, Getting access to that data, being able to analyze the data from all of the different sources that you have was a massive challenge, and Pentaho was really out there solving that challenge. The other one that we really liked about the Pentaho model, and this is one thing that you'll see about us and I'll talk about in terms of our overall core beliefs, was really around we like the open source aspects of Pentaho. We actually are a very open company, very open culture, and we really believe that's where customers wanted to go. They certainly wanted to leverage the open source communities, and that was a core part of that too. So that happened in 2015. Just last month, as Anthony mentioned, we actually have uh, created Hitachi Vantara. And Vantara is a name that talks about advantage and advantage points, but really it's combining a few different organizations together. But frankly, more importantly, how do we actually then combine a lot of the great Hitachi uh, data innovations together and come together? And I'll talk about what's included in Hitachi Vantara here in a minute. And then really our journey overall is really moving forward is you know, how do we actually continue this digital transformation journey and then ultimately move into the world of IoT. And it's interesting, I had a chance to talk to a few customers yesterday and you know, it's, it's mixed in terms of how much you're doing around IoT, but what we're looking to go do and what we'll talk about I think throughout the, the next couple of days is really how do we actually help you deliver what we call edge to outcomes. So regardless of where the data is created, we want to help you capture it, 
We want to help you analyze it, and we want to ultimately help you deliver the outcome that you need for your business. And that's ultimately what the mission of Hitachi Ventara is all about. So as Anthony mentioned, we have three organizations together, and they're included in Hitachi Ventara. But more importantly, it comes down to the capabilities that Hitachi is out here trying to provide to our marketplace, to customers like yourselves, and to potential customers here in the room as well. And this includes what we have around software. This includes all of the experiences that we have around uh, services and solutions. This gets into a lot of capabilities that we have around IT and OT. And so a lot of the different things that Hitachi is bringing to bear in terms of operational technologies, we're starting to provide to our customers as well. I'm sure you've gotten into things around machine learning, artificial intelligence, things along those lines as well. Those are all things that we are actually providing together. And so if you hear about a, um, uh, Lumata, which is around our IoT solutions and software, if you hear around Hitachi Data Systems or Pentaho, that's all part of Hitachi Vantara. And we're super excited because this is the data arm for Hitachi. So if you start talking about better outcomes, better business, better society, this is really where it's at in terms of providing the digital innovations to help you really solve those problems that you're trying to solve for your company and ultimately for your customers as well. So Anthony mentioned transformation, and certainly we've gone through a massive amount of transformation here within Hitachi, but as I was even learning from a number of customers yesterday, each and every one of you are going through your sets of transformation as well. Anthony mentioned it's very important. You either disrupt or you be disrupted. And we had uh, Jeffrey Moore actually speak at our event here about a month ago, and actually another, another customer mentioned Jeffrey Moore yesterday. It's very interesting, really start talking about basically how disruptive this market is today. And I have the opportunity to talk to customers all over the world, regardless of sector, regardless of vertical, regardless of industry, all of these areas are getting disrupted. And so what we look at, and we'll talk about this in terms of our core beliefs within Hitachi Ventara, but basically what we look at is the two most important assets in your organization, certainly people is one, but your data is number two. And I think it's preaching to the choir in terms of the folks that are here in this room. But what we're seeing here is the customers that can actually really understand what's going on in their environment, get control over their data, use that as a massive strategic advantage for their organization, they have a leadership role. You know, Amazon's an easy example. You get into all of these newer type business models. They are leveraging data so much better than anyone else in their marketplace. And I think you are at the forefront of customers really trying to push that envelope. And what will be interesting to see is actually how much influence you have within your own organizations to be able to expand that pie. Because I think right now, you may be a lot more than what the industry norm is in terms of amount of data being analyzed. But if you start looking at where customers need to go and where you need to go, you're gonna to need to have more and more data sources coming in that you can analyze understand, start predicting, and doing amazing things with it here. So really, those are the two key assets that we see when it comes to transformation. Now what's interesting, and if you talk to McKinsey or any of the other ones that are out there right now, most companies have not made this digital transformation journey. And so McKinsey will say less than 40% of companies have actually digitized. Massive amounts of studies out there that say less than 5% of your company's data is actually being analyzed. Now again, for folks in the room here, that may actually be a much higher number, that's great. But at least my uh, kind of unofficial sampling of talking to a number of customers is it's probably not more than 50% in most cases for your organizations. I was talking to a very progressive customer yesterday and it was 30 or 40%. Now not saying that you have to get to 100%, but again, if you get back down to people as well as the data, that data is the most critical asset that you need to make sure you're mining. And again, I think the key one here is really how do you, in your organizations, make sure you have enough influence to be able to help the CIOs, the CEOs, the CFOs, the entire part of the organization to transform. Because really, if you start talking about the executives out there, depending on your organization, some of them are very familiar with all these, these technologies and all of these solutions, and probably a lot of them are not that familiar with it. And so really, how do you actually then go out there and start delivering the value for your executive team that really starts seeing how they can go out and transform. Because you will either disrupt yourself or I guarantee you will be disrupted. 
And that's really, really critical, I think, all of us in terms of how we actually want to go out there and transform. It's certainly the mission of Hitachi Vintara is to partner with you to really deliver those kinds of outcomes to your organization to really make sure you're the one disrupting as opposed to being disrupted. So let me spend a few minutes around our core beliefs. And again, this gets down to kind of some key beliefs that we have that we believe is differentiated relative to others that are out there in the marketplace. And so certainly data is critical. And if you look at Pentaho and the Pentaho product set and the different things we're doing there, that is front and center to what we believe in terms of keys to your transformation. It's that and the talent and people that you actually have in your organization, front and center. The other big thing that is very, very critical for us, and I would really ask that you make sure you fully understand this around our approach, this is the Hitachi's approach, is we want you to own your data. We don't want to own your data. We want you to own your data. So if you think around things like walled gardens and all those other things that are out there as well, that's not what we're about. It's a reason why we bought Pentaho that it leverages the open source communities. We want you to leverage whatever communities that you want that help drive your business forward and that we can help add value for that. And we think that's fundamentally different. There's a number of companies out there that want to work with you that want to own your data. You know, this is around the Hotel Californias, the clouds, the this, the that, or what have you. We actually want to make sure you have the keys to your kingdom that you can then decide to put your data wherever it is. You know, there's a lot of discussions yesterday around cloud and how it intersects with the big data in the analytics world and where it's going to go. There's a lot of different changes that are going to happen. But I think I would really challenge you to make sure you work with companies that really have your best interests in mind as opposed to they really want to completely control and own your data. Whether they say they do or not, it's really more about the actions that they actually do day in and day out. We spend a lot of time internally talking about metadata. And we actually joke internally, metadata is the new data. And so it really gets into, if you want to start talking about how you analyze all of the data in your environments, whether that's actually stuff that you're doing within your Hadoop and your lakes, in your warehousing environment, or that's all of the other unstructured data that has absolutely no structure to it whatsoever. Across the entire situation there, you want to be able to search all of that metadata and then ultimately pull the actual data itself whenever it's relevant. And so we see actually the situation where you're going to actually have a lot more analytics happening at the metadata layer that then is ultimately going to start pulling the right records or the right objects, if you will, that are going to help you then understand what you want to understand in your environment. And so it's really critical in terms of how these are going to change over time around metadata is the most important piece of information out there, especially when you start moving from the world of terabytes to petabytes and then the world from petabytes to hundreds of petabytes or to exabytes of data. And again, there's numbers of customers that we work with that have exabytes of data, and they're still growing at 30 or 40 or 50% per year. This is around thousands and thousands of applications that are creating data. How do they actually get control over that? And we really believe the metadata is going to get separated. You're going to have a whole different kind of analytics tier for the metadata that then can pull back the right data at the right time for your environment. The other key belief that we have, and I'm sure you see this in your environment as well, is certainly the data is going to outlive the application that created it and the underlying infrastructure. And so if you look at the applications, and I'm sure you have a lot of new applications that are happening in your environment, mobile apps or what have you, average use of the life of an application outside of the custom ones that your company built 20 some years ago that you're trying to band-aid you know, through and keep up. But if you look at new applications, the average use of life is one to three years. Infrastructure, maybe you can stretch it to five to seven years. But most often, you're going to want to keep that data forever, or at least certainly most often longer than the one to three years or the five to seven years. And that's really, really critical in terms of how we actually look at the environment. But if you look at most of the architectures that are out there today, they are still very much siloed in their environment. So if you look at the application, data is getting created in an application. It usually gets captive in that application, and then it strands that data on a particular infrastructure. And the only thing that's actually outside of that is what you're doing within your warehousing environments. Great, you're starting to pull some of that data out. You're starting to put that into your lakes as well. But we believe that you need to still cover a vast majority of other parts of your environment that are still very much siloed out there. And so if you have applications that are kind of outside their useful life, but they still have that data that you need, how do you start pulling all of those sources of data in there? And again, that's where Pentaho actually is really core to Hitachi Ventara's overall strategy. 
And then if you had to actually summarize what we do, so what Hitachi Ventara does in terms of our overall kind of data value proposition, we enable you to have your data and insight when, where, and how you need it. Your data, when, where, and how you need it. Very simply, and that's what we do. And certainly, I know we have a number of customers either here in the room. I know Pintaho has over 1,500 customers. Hitachi Ventara has over 10,000 customers. And so there's a number of great use cases, I think, that we work with, whether it's the NASDAQ or BT or Caterpillar or CERN. And again, we're going to appreciate all of the partnership that we do. And one thing that's really near and dear, and I think you've seen this with Pentaho, hopefully you will see this in the future with Hitachi as well. We are very interested in becoming your partner. We are not interested in being your vendor. We really look for long-term partnerships that's really near and dear to our heart. We are very much invested in helping you deliver the right solutions for your company. Those better outcomes, that better business, and ultimately that double bottom line the better society as well. It's really critical in terms of what we do. Anthony also mentioned around artificial intelligence and machine learning as well. And so what we're being able to do now with Hitachi Ventara is bring to bear all of the data and digital innovations that Hitachi has to offer. This gets into the 300 plus data scientists that we have now with access to as opposed to what we had before with Pentaho. This gets into the thousands and thousands of engineers and the innovation that we actually have and bring to bear. And this is across all of the different verticals out there. And so we're really excited about that. Certainly, hopefully, over the next couple of days, you'll learn a little bit more about what we're doing around AI and machine learning and all the aspects of that as well. But it's really, really critical in terms of we are continuing to push forward with these new innovations that ultimately help deliver the outcomes that you need and want for your overall business. So this is Hitachi Ventara. The key focus for our organization overall is really how do we actually help you deliver what we call these edge to outcomes. And I mentioned it earlier, but this is around wherever that data gets created, or even if you need to create that data from the physical world and, and actually then translate it into a digital world, into sensors, into virtual sensors, or what have you, we want to partner with you to deliver these edge to outcomes. That's what we do. That is our core focus. This is an organization, again, 60% of our uh, revenue comes from software and services, much more as a service type offering. I know a number of you have worked with Pintaho in the past as kind of more of a subscription and an as a service offering. We are going to continue to do that, and you'll see more and more service offerings there. We, we believe we have a huge differentiation when it comes to not just pairing up IT, but also bringing in a lot of the operational knowledge as well. And there is no other company on the planet that has the IT and the OT capabilities that Hitachi has. And we're going to bring those more and more to bear to add value for your overall business. We have obviously over 10,000 customers, like I mentioned before. The big one is we do shine in the larger, more complex environments. That doesn't mean that your organization needs to be a five or 10 or $20 billion organization. It means to be the data and the data kind of requirements that you have for your business. That's where we shine. That's what we're really good at, solving these very complex problems is really what's very, very important for us. That's really where we see our competitive advantage and really helping deliver a lot of value for your organizations as well. Uh, the ecosystem is really important. I know we have a number of partners here. I certainly want to thank you for all of the partnership that we have. We have over 2,000 partners, and we'll continue to actually evolve the ecosystem as these markets mature. Certainly a lot of more partnerships in the open source community, a number of other areas that we're working on that are really, really critical for our success. And then one thing that I'm very passionate about really is around leadership and culture. And certainly we've made a number of changes on the Hitachi Ventara leadership team to make sure that we can continue to propel and drive our transformation as well. And transformation is a never ending thing. And it's actually, uh, you know, we talk a lot internally around how do we actually get the right mindset to make sure that our organization can transform. And then culture is the second key piece of that, which is really, really important for us as well. And really very important is around how do we actually have the right culture that can sustain. It's not about any one individual. It's about how does actually the team come together and collectively deliver these double bottom line solutions to our customer, which are really critical. We've been very fortunate. We had a number of kind of culture awards over the years. But that's really more of an outcome of the leadership and the culture that we've created, which we're very thankful for. So with that, I want to thank you very much for just a quick opportunity to talk to you about Hitachi and Hitachi Ventara as well. Thank you.
So next up, I'd actually like to, uh, to introduce Brian Hopkins. He's actually from Forrester. He's one of the first people at Forrester that started writing about big data. And he's been working on big data and cloud and a number of other areas here. And so he's going to actually talk about his views in terms of what's happening in the market today. Thank you. Hi. Wow, I love this venue. This is a great venue, isn't it? So when Pintaho came and asked me to speak, I had an internal debate with myself for a little bit about what to call this. I mean, should I talk about big data? Certainly, I've written a lot about that, and you've heard a lot about that. Or is it about advanced analytics? Should I call it AI? Nah. I think you guys are pretty bombarded with that. So what I decided to call it was, or to make this talk about digital. And I want to, in about the next half an hour, explain why I did that to you, or why I'm doing that to you, or talking to you about that, and really leave you with three key pieces of information that I think that all of you need to thrive and survive in the digital age. Now, our data as a research firm, we, we, we talk to lots of customers all the time, and we ask them, one of the questions we ask them is, are you involved in a digital transformation of some form or kind? Can, who here is involved or helping their business, or is their business doing something that has digital in the investment? Right? Probably, yep, about half of you, right? So that's what our data says. Over half of companies are involved in some kind of transformation to become more digital. In fact, a lot of the companies that we talk to, that we work with, like Home Depot, Westpac Bank in Australia, Unilever, are publicly talking about spending billions, that's with a B, dollars, to transform their business to become digital, right? So it's high priority. It really is a high priority thing that we see. Um, here's the problem when I talk to companies that are on this digital transformation, right? Because how are they going about it? We, we understand how to change, right? We plan, build, run. It's linear, it takes two, three, four years. We've been changing and helping our business change for a very long time. Here's the problem. I'll drop it in, all right? These nasty little digital predators or nasty big digital predators seem to be changing the rules of business right out from under our feet. So every time we help our business, okay, this is the strategy, this is what we're gonna do. We need to go to the board, we need to get a billion dollars, we need to invest it, we need to da 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 Three or four years later, the rules have totally changed. And that's a problem. In fact, it's such a problem that often that happens. And it becomes the only thing we really worry about is what happens when Amazon moves into my business, right? So let me state this problem another way. We are thinking about applying big data analytics and IoT and all these things to help our companies become more digital in a linear way. It takes time, it's hard. We have to invest, we have to change. The problem is, is these digital disruptors aren't playing by linear rules, right? Because they're using technology which is not changing linearly to keep up with customers who are really driving the show. It's customers who are, who are driving all this change. And these digital disruptors are using and exploiting technology often better than other enterprises, and therefore they're able to change much faster and keep up with changing customer expectations. <clears throat> Come to find out, this isn't a new phenomenon, right? A fellow by the name of Ray Kurzweil, he uh, worked for Google for a while, he's a PhD, he's written a lot of stuff, thought leader, I think he founded Singularity University, uh, he wrote a paper back in 2001 called The Law of Accelerating Returns. It's a real interesting paper. It's online. You can read it if you want. It's a very detailed, long, kind of rambling and mathematical. But at the end of the day, when you wade through all the math, he says three important things, right? He says when systems like information technology systems evolve, when one generation of technology builds on the next generation of technology, the returns of that next generation of technology are more than they were the previous generation. So every generation of technology accelerates over the generation above. So they get, you get accelerating returns, more and more benefit as technology or as systems evolve. And he says when this happens, what you see 
is exponential changes in the fundamental measures of that system. For technology, it's cost and, and speed or power. So cost goes down, speed and power go up, and they do so at consistent intervals. So really what he said is, Moore's law is not as this aberration, this one-time thing that we have to deal with. It's not, the, it's not an exception, it's the rule. So when you look out really at the environment and everyone that's played off of Moore's law, we see a whole lot of Moore's law-like things going on. So I'll name, you can look these up if you want to, right? So that's really playing out to be true. So what we have to learn to do is realize that we're not living in a linear world, right? Technology is hyper-accelerating the pace of business. <clears throat> Let me make this a little bit more practical if we think in the terms of big data, right? So I published this in a report called uh, Move Your Big Data to the Cloud. And one of the things that I argue in that report is, is that, for instance, take a look at Hadoop. You look at Hadoop, it took about 10 years. In fact, I have a T-shirt that I got on Hadoop's 10th birthday. So um, I was wearing it yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, Hadoop took about 10 years, so you could kind of sit back and watch it come and go, okay, I got time to deal with this. Now, Spark went in about three years from a Berkeley Amp Lab science project to replacing Hadoop for a lot of use cases, so it happened a little faster. So it's easy to say, well, maybe I didn't call the linear pace fast enough. Maybe that, that line is, I'm trying to project the heads a little, bit, a little bit faster. I hope it's still linear. And then along come things like artificial intelligence, deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow. And those go from a conception into really disruptive forces like almost overnight. And so when you think about what's going on, you step back and you go, hmm, I'm not in a linear world. I'm not in a linear system. So things like cloud and early generations of big data technology are accelerating future directions. That's exactly what Kurzweil said. So, what that really means is this. As we invest in data and analytics and the underlying infrastructure and technology to do those things, a lot of, we have a lot of, as IT professionals, we have a lot of, uh, of priorities. We want to be efficient. We want to be secure. We want to be compliant. Those are all really important things. But recognize this, in an exponentially changing system, I think this number's right, 90% of the benefit happens in the last doubling cycle. 90% of the change. And when you go back to Kurzweil's paper, the whole point of his paper was our brains can't get around that because we're marching along linearly. So as things change exponentially, what that really means is that the increasingly important objectives for investing in data and analytics and all the infrastructure is flexibility, speed, and agility, right? And as we march on and move faster and faster, those are gonna be increasingly important to the point where they may eclipse everything else. I think that they will. It's gonna take a little time, right? So when we think about how this applies to digital business, what we really mean is the, the pursuit of customers and profitability and our pursuit of being digital to keep up with those customers and to be more profitable is requiring us to think architecturally differently about how we invest in technology and to think differently about how we put our businesses together. Truly, digital is changing the rules of business. Changing the rules. <clears throat> so when we talk to companies that are on this transformation journey from, to become a more digital business, what we typically find is three sets of, of technology-infused projects or, or transformations going on. There's some IoT stuff going on. Right, so connected products, OT folks operating uh, systems that are with device data to become efficient, IT and OT, connected products kind of things. We see a lot of mobile or digital work or customer experience or digital customer experience work often stood up by marketing or sales. And we see a lot of enterprise work, right? ERP, supply chain, employee experience, all these things. And they're all good things, but they're all kind of here, there, and everywhere. And as companies, these companies that are investing billions to transform and to really become digital, what they recognize they need to do is they need to bring all those things together into four key competencies, right? They need integrated, cross-lifecycle, cross-channel, digital customer experiences. They need digital operational excellence so their processes are efficient. 
They need to be able to innovate digitally with digital technology to keep up with those disruptors. And the last thing they need to do is understand that they're part of a digital ecosystem. They're not standing alone. They're not competing alone. They build partnerships, exchanging products and services and data and insight. So when you think about this future of being digital, the connective tissue between today and tomorrow and the people who are going to make that happen are sitting in this room right here. Because it's the data and the analytics that all these things have in common. But how do you do data and analytics to enable you on this digital journey? Well, with Forrester, we have a label for that. We call it a system of insight. And what a system of insight is, is it's not a BI reporting. Someone's got to look at some data to make a decision. Rather, it's an application that sources data, performs various analytics to find actionable knowledge or insight, implements that insight in software to drive action, measures the outcomes, which is in turn is data, which is then fed back into the pool of data so you can iterate around and around that closed loop, right? That works really well for customer digital experience because customers are changing so fast, you have to be able to understand what they're doing and keep up with them. It also works pretty well in IoT, right? When real-time data and real-time decision-making, specifically when you get outside the data center into the edge, is becoming increasingly important. So if building these systems of insight is the way that you're going to help your company achieve its ambitions for digital, if you're with me so far and you need to do that to keep up with the pace of business innovation and the pace of technology-driven change, there are really three things I want you to remember. Right? Three pieces of, actually there's four. I'll leave one for the very end, a little nugget. So there's three things I want you to take away from here. They are. You need to change your brain thinking from needing a data lake or expanding your data lake to having a data fabric or a big data fabric. And I'll explain what that is. You need to optimize your architecture to take advantage of innovations in the public cloud as a real competitive advantage. And the last thing is, is you need ways to orchestrate on multiple levels to support the scale that you need to operate while still remaining flexible. So three things. So let's drill into those a little bit, and then I'll offer some closing advice. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between a data lake and a data fabric. And this is the real story. I was talking with a chief customer officer uh, two weeks ago from a major bank in Asia Pacific. And I was playing this conversation back to him, which is based on dozens of conversations I've had with IT professionals just like you. And I was saying, what I see happening is companies that have gotten ahead of the power curve and built the data lake and brought in Hadoop and so on and so forth are now coming back to me and saying, I built it and the business wasn't all that crazy about it. And I say, well, why did you build it? <clears throat> and the general answer goes something like this. My business kept coming to me and saying, where's my data? And I said, well, it's in the warehouse. Well, that's not fresh or fast, or how much will it cost to put new data in there? Oh, it'll take six weeks, three weeks, 10 weeks, whatever it is, a couple hundred thousand, and we can retest and load in the warehouse. That's too slow. So we being on top of IT and new, uh, new kinds of innovations, looked at Hadoop and said, oh, wait a minute. What if we just load it all in the lake? So when you come to me and say, where's my data? It's in the lake. Just go get it. The problem is, is that it, what this chief customer officer told me is his business was still building the data lake. It was over budget. Now they had to upgrade it. And by the way, the data was really stinky. And he didn't like it. So he was, he was coming to me saying, how do I get IT on board with what I need? Right? And that's the problem with the data lake architecture. So don't get me wrong, data lakes have their place, but they're not the end all be all that we thought they were gonna be. So that brings me to a data fabric. So what is a data fabric, right? A data fabric can include a data lake. In fact, it can include several data lakes. Large manufacturers I'm working with right now tell me, look, I don't have one. I have about four or five built all over the place over time. So there, there are really two differences to data lakes. Number one, they increasingly separate storage and compute, right? Because as you are on your digital journey and you're capturing data, you're always going to be scaling out the amount of data that you capture. And depending on the format and the speed of the data, there are different places you want to put and keep that data. 
to make it available and to both efficiently store it. So you need a, a way to scale the data out always. Analytic compute scales in and out, up and down, right? So the problem with data lakes, specifically ones that are based on Hadoop, is they couple data and compute. You just bring the compute to the data. And that's not really what's needed. So data fabrics increasingly separate storage and compute. The next thing they do is they feature ways to orchestrate the movement and availability of data at different levels of quality in an automated way. So you can have the right data where you need it, whether it's Redshift, whether it is Hadoop or Impala, whether it's a, 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 a data warehouse or a database, right? You need the, that flexibility. So they give you the ability to orchestrate these, the, and automate the scale that you need. Right, so those, those are the two differences. Let's talk about the cloud piece for a moment. We published a study last year in 2016 estimating the market for big data cloud, for big data solutions and different kinds of solutions. I did not work on this study. It was done by a different group that does these marketing things. But when they brought it to me and put it in front of me and said, Brian, here's what we found, and I looked at this data, and I said, holy moly, that matches exactly what I'm seeing. Good job. And what I'm seeing is this massive shift, and I started in 16, from companies who have got ahead of the complex open source on-premise big data thing and now realize, man, I got to upgrade Spark. I got a Hadoop 3 is coming. I'm doing all this stuff. I'm under-delivering on the value. I need a better way to do it, which is why we think in 2018, 50% of firms will publicly declare a public cloud first strategy. They'll make every effort to do their big data analytics in the public cloud, specifically because they've run into this on-premise wall and it's not meeting the business needs. And that is being reflected by the market data that we're collecting and seeing. But the real nail in the coffin of on-premise big data is the pace of innovation. So when I talk and look, and I just published a wave on major cloud vendors insight and analytics capabilities, and uh, um, one of the things that I found is that these Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, a lot of the smaller players as well that are operating pu as pure play public cloud vendors are able to throw innovations into their platforms and make those innovations available to customers with a credit card and a URL turned on. So you can go and incorporate new things like serverless SQL for Amazon Athena or deep, big data deep learning analytics from Google TensorFlow, or this thing called quantum computing, which is coming in a few years. That, those things, quantum computing units, will be available in the cloud. So if your architecture isn't optimized for the public cloud, companies that I talk to who are optimizing their architecture for the public cloud are telling me that's our competitive weapon. We know how to do this better than our competitors so we can move faster. Right? So you have to understand how these cloud innovations are going to allow you to move faster. And to some extent, you've got to place your bets on which set of vendors and which innovations are going to be the right ones for you. The last piece I want to talk to you about is the orchestration piece. <clears throat> and at issue here is as you look to bring IoT out of the silos that it's in into part of your digital strategy, where your connected products or your connected systems are providing information in a secure way to your marketing and sales organization and your customer experience organization. Really, that's the end-all, be-all, is to connect it all together, right? It's really about what do I do with the edge, which is really kind of anything that's not in your data center and cloud. And so in some research, we looked at the different kinds of things that are popping up in the edge, including gateways and edge devices, and we looked at the characteristics of those things in terms of power consumption, memory, compute, ability to do analytics, and they're very different pieces parts. How are we going to cope with this? It's more data. It's data that has to be managed. It's hyper-local data management. And how do we push analytics out of the data center to some of these edge things because we're going to be, and we, our data says that you're going to be increasingly bandwidth constrained. Well, there's really three things we see happening there. Number one, companies that are doing this and doing this well are all using a microservices-based ar application architecture because they need that containerized way to be flexible in the applications that they produce. Right? They need behind those microservices packaged applications 
a set of data orchestration and federation tools that allow them to source those applications with, and, and the databases in those applications with the right data in the right time. They need an enormous amount of flexibility. Kind of sounds like a, a data fabric. And the last thing they need underneath all that is they need a containerized infrastructure orchestration management layer, right, to support pushing containers with data and analytics from the cloud in the data center out into the edge and back. And we're seeing vendors increasingly support that kind of a use case. So they're all doing these three things. So I said, from a data analytics perspective, you really need two things, right? First off, you need a way to orchestrate what's going on with the data in your organization at an enterprise level, at scale, in the cloud. And then you need a way to separate the delivery of data to your business in a way that lets you say, yes, I can answer that need for data and views of data within a day, not weeks. The second thing you need is you need ways to manage in a growing number of containers at scale and deploy those containers into an increasing variety of different hardware platforms that are popping up on the edge using things like Kubernetes and Rocket, Docker. Those are the two things you need, all right? So let me, let me kind of close our conversation here with an example. So Logitech is a big manufacturer, and I had the privilege of talking with these guys a, a year ago, and they kind of resurface now in, 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 uh, as uh, Pentaho users. And so the first thing when I was talking with uh, Logitech about how they m met their needs, the first thing I noticed is, number one, they did it in the cloud, 100% in the cloud. I said, bravo. I was talking with another manufacturer. I won't, I won't uh, I'll, uh, hide the name to protect the, the guilty. But they did the same thing a couple of years ago. They went 100% in the cloud, but this other manufacturer went 100% in the cloud. And the first thing they did is they hired a Hadoop distributor and installed Hadoop in Amazon and built, in my opinion, a fairly rigid infrastructure in the cloud because it was all based on writing Spark jobs to transform data from the cloud object store into some SQL Hadoop way of querying data. And so as new data sources came along, they had to rewrite the Spark jobs, retest the Spark jobs, and oh, by the way, the data scientists wanted a different version of Spark, but they were working on one cluster, so they had to plan to upgrade Spark to support the data scientists and rewrite their jobs, and around and around that circle they went, right? Very in the cloud, but still fairly rigid, not cloud optimized. Logitech didn't go that way. Instead, what Logitech did is said, well, we might need Hadoop someday. They're open to it, building a data lake. But initially, no Hadoop. What they did instead is they have a data orchestration layer that they built on Pentaho that works in a data publisher, data subscriber kind of way, kind of similar to the way Kafka is doing, but not real time, more, more in batch because larger data sets. And what this infrastructure does is it, 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 it breaks up the loading of data and the consumption of data into, into producer and consumer templates. And because they have templates, they can outsource a lot of this work to, to, to their partners and get it done very efficiently. And it also allows them to continue producing and consuming data, which gets stored in Amazon S3 if one side breaks. So if the consumer side for Redshift breaks, they can keep loading. Or if the loader breaks, they can keep consuming because they buffered this in a pub sub model, right? One of the things that I thought was interesting about this case study was they said, once we did this, we recognized that we could automate because we were working with templates, with an orchestration solution, with tools in the cloud, 90% of what our DBAs were doing. So when you think about a data fabric, that's the essence of a data fabric. Because what they did is they did this orchestration, taking advantage of cloud where it made sense. And then they layered a data virtualization tool on top of their data orchestration layer to separate out provisioning of data to tools like uh, 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 Pentaho Business Analytics, other tools like Tableau or Click. Many, many different parts of their very large distributed businesses had different needs for data and analytics. And they separated that out with a data virtualization layer. Made a lot of sense. 
So now they're able to be agile to meet their business demand for analytics and different kinds of data and be both scalable and agile in the way that they orchestrate the movements of data and taking advantage of things like cloud object stores and Hadoop. Eventually, I think they'll probably end up implementing some part of Hadoop when it makes sense to do so, right? So they really have embodied a lot of these characteristics and what that does for them is that positions them very well to now increasingly pursue their IoT agenda. Right? It's a pretty good example. So let me close out, kind of summarize some of the things I've told you, and I'll give you that bonus tidbit. So what did we talk about today? First thing we talked about here is, as you pursue the Internet of Things, and seek to add the Internet of Things investments into that, into your enterprise, as you bring those together, it ceases to become about IoT, it becomes about digital, right? Remember, today's speed is tough, but it's the acceleration that will kill you if you can't keep up. So not only do you have to go fast, but you have to be getting faster all the time. Which means that as you consider what to invest in, and I talk to uh, um, clients like you all the time, and they say, what should we do for our next generation data lake? What should we do as we migrate in the cloud? Is, or it's, more, it's more like, here's our strategy, Brian, what do you think about this strategy? My advice to them is always very similar. The most important thing you can invest in is the ability to be agile, flexible, and fast in the future. So, so these three to five year plans, if you have a three year plan, I say crumple it up and throw it away. The only thing I can tell you about your three year plan, in three years you won't be doing what you think you're gonna be doing, it'll be different. So you have to invest in being able to shift and adapt. So therefore the three things that we talked about that you have to master to survive and thrive in this digitally accelerating world is you don't need data lakes, you probably need several, and you need to stitch things together in a fabric architecture. You need to optimize yourself for taking increasing advantage of the public cloud. And you need to focus on many levels of orchestration so you can keep up the scale and maintain the flexibility. And here's the last thing I didn't tell you. I haven't really talked about this yet. I could, go, I could do a whole other 30 minute speech on this, I don't have time. And that is this, when I talk to companies that have done this, and have done it well, and I always ask in interviews, the very last question, if you could go back and talk to yourself of two years ago, what would you tell them? And very consistently I get this answer. We wish we'd started the data work earlier. Talking about the metadata, the governance. It's hard, nobody wants to invest in it. And every company that I talk to that's walked this path says, we eventually got to the point where we knew we had to do it. So therefore, companies, when you can muster the will to bake these investments into your digital transformation plans and do them in a way that makes sense and also gets that hard work done, you'll be far ahead of your competition. And I, I wish you the best of luck, and I hope that's you. So thank you very much, and I'll be around this afternoon. Take care. Thank you so much, Brian. Wasn't that exciting? I'm going to ask it again. Wasn't that exciting? Jeez, you guys are making me work hard. I thought this was vacation. The key things that I heard in the back that I really want to just focus on real quick is just that we have to be agile in the transformation. You have to invest in adapting to, as, you know, as the world changes, you need to change, even though you have plans. It's that innovation that you have to be careful to cultivate. It's with that I would like to introduce someone who's well-renowned, world-renowned rather, in connective cars. She's known as one of the leading women in IoT. She has over 12 years experience with data intelligence, ambient intelligence, uh, all sorts of ways of getting new life out of data. Help me welcome the Director of Innovation of IMS, Ella Halal. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, 
Who can tell me what this car is? Aston Martin, yep. Do you know which one? It, it came in a movie. Which movie was that? James Bond, yeah. It was the 2015 James Bond movie. It's pretty, huh? But not all cars started that pretty. In the 17, 18, and 19th centuries, there was a big fight between the different fuel sources to which one will drive the cars. Steam, electric engines, and combustion engines, as we know them today, were actually competing early on. In 1885, Carl's Bend came with the first practical car as we know it today. Henry Ford, after, was able to commercialize it and make a big deployment of the Model T. Then came the seat belts, the car engines, uh, the car keys, the airbags, the APS, and a lot of the innovation that we enjoy today in the cars. So today's automobile is, dominated, uh, is dominating machines that had undergone 100 years of evolution. So could it, today's cars are faster, more agile, and more fuel efficient than their older counterparts. Over 1.2 billion cars are on the roads today worldwide. And 80 million, 88 million were sold in 2016 alone. So cars had a profound impact on the way we live our lives. How many of you use a car on a daily basis? More hands, please, yep. Yeah, almost everybody. So if you think about it, an average person roughly makes 10 trips a day between dropping your kids to school, going to work, picking up your kids, maybe picking groceries or meeting some friends. You do 10 trips a day. You spend 4.5 years in your vehicle. That's a long time. Actually, an interesting statistics, Americans were stuck in traffic 8 billion hours collectively, 8 billion hours in 2015 alone, 8 billion hours. That's time that we can all sit and binge Netflix. Won't we all love that? <laughs> so that, ca that came to so something. We need to think of driving as a utility. The way we live our lives today depends essentially on driving. Our modern society, it's the heartbeat of the modern society. We commute to work. We commute to visit our friends, family. We even drive. To for enjoyment sometimes. So we need to think of driving as a utility. But if we're spending all of that time to drive, if we're spending all of that time in the car, we should enjoy it. And to be able to do that, we need to think of connected car. And when, we, when I say connected car, I don't mean connecting it to the internet. Because what does, how does that really help me? I mean connecting it to me. If that means connecting it to the internet too, sure. But when I say connecting it to me, I mean giving, making the car give me actionable insights, help me achieve my goals, making, it, making the drive enjoyable experience for me, making it convenient for me. And there's a lot of drive for this definition of connectivity. Number one, people like me who are demanding convenience, so it's customer demand. We're all living this connected lifestyle with our wearables, with our mobile phones as an extension to our arms. So we need connectivity in the vehicle too. We're living in a fast changing environment where distances we need to come smaller and shorter. You live in, I know friends that would live in San Jose and actually work in San Diego which is crazy from my end to commute that distance every day, but they do. And then there's billions of dollar investments as well as a need for autonomous vehicles. All of that is driving the definition of the connected car and the need for the connected car. So how can we enable the connected car? Well, we're lucky enough to live in an era where vehicles have become sensor rich. You have about 
100 million lines of code in a vehicle today. Um, it has a processing power of about 20 personal computers. And roughly, uh, it processes about 25 gigabytes per hour. That's a lot of data. And this is all on the cars today. But that's not only it. We are also living in an ambiguous computing era where we have so many sensors all around us, including on us sometimes. And all of this can collect data that will help define mobility, how we drive, and where we're going. So using all of these diverse sources, we can collect information about mobility. And our mission at IMS is to enable the connected car. And we did that by building the IMS Drive Sync Connected Car Platform. It's a platform featured a unified data engine that enables mobility services. And the core of it is data. So my day-to-day -day job is to make sense of about 10 trillion data points. Sometimes overwhelming, but enjoyable, I can guarantee you. <laughs> so, think about it this way. So what is data? Data is a summary of thousands of stories. But they cannot speak them. They rely on us to tell the stories, to give them a clear voice of what they're saying. So, we started crafting the lifestyle narrative, trying to understand the driver behavior. Is he normally aggressive, or today is he just having a bad day? What's the habits? When do you usually leave home? And how can we help you have a better commute? And customer preferences, whatever that means. So we try to understand all of this, and to be able to understand that, we work on all types of analytics. Starting from data cleansing, which from my point of view, is actually the hardest part because we collect data from heterogeneous platforms that are noisy, with different sensors, with different quality. And of course, how many here works with data on a day-to-day basis? Yeah, more hands, yeah. So you guys know the pains of noisy data. And then we work with descriptive analytics. So descriptive analytics is understanding what is happening. Then, we're, we're, then there's diagnostic analytics which is why this is happening. So if I identify that you're swerving, are you swerving to avoid something, like a cat or a dog or a kid running after his ball? Or are you swerving because you're distracted or inattentive? There's a big difference between these two. Then we try to look into predictive analytics. Try to understand what you're gonna do next. And like, our holy grail is prescriptive analytics. Can we impact your opinion? Can we help you change your mind to do something that is less riskier? Can we assist you? So there's a big power of all these types of analytics, and these are examples of what can be done with it. From something as simple as risk proxies, that understanding where is your garage location and your mileage estimate of how much driving you do a year, all the way to driver intent, understanding your motivation behind certain actions, and harder is understanding your state of mind. Even I sometimes don't understand my state of mind. So I'll give you some examples of what can be done. So this is a trip, plotted, and as you can see here from the data, it's very clear the difference between your idling driving in city, and driving on a highway. And better, better more, you can also look at the difference between harsh acceleration, which is a behavior, in rest, and on a highway. It's, it's quite interesting, huh? But not only that. Data is more powerful, powerful aggregated. So for this slide, I looked at 17 million driving trips from three countries. US, Canada, and Europe, well, Germany. And aggregated all of them. And the interesting part was that regardless where you are, 
your average trip is roughly 15 minutes, roughly 15 kilometers, and you're driving on 30 kilometers per hour. It's quite interesting that regardless where you are, it mainly converges to these specific numbers. Even if you're a longer commute, you usually stop in the middle, which was quite interesting. But also if you look here on that side, you can see that usually most driving happens in the daytime. And even if you drive at night, you tend to overspeed and tend to drive longer distances. So that was quite interesting to see that these habits between these different countries are actually converging. But not only that. So we all know that distracted driving is a big, big issue. And the statistics say that about 25% of all crashes in the US are based on because of texting and driving. So again, we looked into the data. Data can tell lots of stories, which confirmed. So we looked at 53% of trips have some sort of distraction. 39% have distractions while you're stationary, like in a traffic light or a stop sign. So you pick the phone, look at the text, put it down, and drive. 36 of them had some sort of distraction while you're in the move, which is bad. And the average distracted driving duration is 94 seconds, which is about a minute and a half. So imagine you have your eyes off the road for a minute and a half. It's, it's quite um, interesting to see that these stats. Not only that, we are able actually also to look into crashes. So data can tell us exactly what happened in a crash, can tell us the story. So if you look here, this is somebody who's reversing, hit a post, and bounced back. Isn't it powerful what data can tell us? So to be able to enable all of these awesome insights, this is our system. We have our system. And in the heart of it, within our business center, as well as enhanced data feeds, we have Pentaho integrated to help enable reports, fast reports and fast creation of reports for our clients. But although we had great success so far, this is not it. This is not the end of it. Because we, are, we as humans, our preferences are changing. Who here has a kid 16 years or older? I don't, but you can raise your hand. <laughs> 16 years, okay, so quite a number. Okay, so let me tell you a story. I have these co-ops coming for an internship. They are roughly 22 years of age, third and fourth year university. They are coming in, they're very excited, happy to help. They came in and the first thing I said, awesome, I need you guys to do some test drives for me. Like, uh, sure, I'm like, okay, do you have a car? No, okay, no worries. I have a car for testing, you can take it. You have a driver license. And I hear silence. I'm like, what? You don't have driver licenses? No. And it was mind boggling for me because I remember as soon as I turned 16, the first thing I got my dad to do is to drive me to get my driver license. They don't even have a G1, which was mind boggling. So we are living in an era where Gen Zs and the younger generations are changing the, their mentality. They are multimodal transporters. They want to use an Uber, a zip car, um, a bus, and they can use all of them in the same day. So there is a great paradigm shift from vehicle ownership to vehicle usership. And instead of ha owning a car that use it only for 5% of the time, and your car is idle for 90% of the time and roughly used by one or two people, to a car that is used 100% of the time to its fullest capacity. So there's a big paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift is actually enabling the, uh, the need for autonomous vehicles. So autonomous vehicle will enhance the productivity as well as the driver convenience and experience. So how many of you knows the five levels of autonomous vehicles? Okay, a few hands. So there are five levels of autonomous vehicles as defined. So level zero is your 1970s dad's car. 
does nothing but drive good, you enjoy it, but you as a human driver, you are the one in full control. Level one would have one thing that is autonomous, like cruise control or automatic braking, one feature that is enabled. Level two would have two or more features that can happen simultaneously. Level three can have a little bit of autonomy, but human needs to be fully alert and ready to intervene at any moment of time. Level four, partially autonomous. That means it can be autonomous under very specific scenarios. So for example, autonomous on highways only. And then you have level five that is fully autonomous, you sitting, watching your Netflix, playing your Pokemon Go, or whatever your heart desire. You don't need to do anything, even taking a nap. So out of all of this, where do you think we are today? Where do you think the Teslas and the Google cars are? Five, nope. So they are actually between level two and level three, somewhere in between. You need, to, you need a driver that is fully alert, Google Car will only function under very, very specific scenarios when the, the, the mapping is very accurate and detailed. Um, Teslas need to have a driver that is fully alert and ready to intervene at any time. So we're far away from five. But we have made great progress. So over the past few years, we actually made a great strides toward autonomous vehicle into vehicle automation. However, we still have a long way to go. And think about it, the hardest part of level five is that you would have level zero to four coexisting on the same road. So your level five needs to be able to interact successfully with all others on the road. But I think the biggest challenge is not the technology. I think the biggest challenge is human perception. So the biggest challenge for autonomous car and its adaption is how can an autonomous vehicle provide an experience that meets the human desires, that are satisfactory? So let's think about it quickly. How, how many of you have a friend, have a partner, has a family member that they think, this person thinks that they are the best drivers ever and you think they are the craziest driver ever? Yep, raise hands, everybody. So driving is subjective. It's very, very subjective behavior. And it's not easy that you sit there comfortably trusting your life, and more importantly, the lives of your kids and your loved ones with no control. Just a quick exercise, exercise thought. Think about planes. How many people are afraid of planes versus how many people are afraid of cars? And if you look at the mortality rates in cars, it's way higher than planes. It, sense of control usually helps. And when you give up control and you don't even have a steering wheel or the right to intervene with level five autonomy, the human perception and human trust is the biggest challenge. So for us to be able to incorporate human trust and human um, desire, we need to analyze and understand human state of mind and human intent. And to be able to do that, we would need to do data analytics. So I started my talk with the different types of fuel that power the vehicles as we know it today. And I will end it by saying that the vehicles of the future would be powered by data analytics, big data analytics. And I will leave you with this, information is the oil of the 21st century. And analytics is its combustion engine. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Ella. Thank you. I love that analogy, I love that statement. Information is the oil of the next century. And analytics is the combustion engine that's going to power everything. Love this story with IMS because it shows how you can take the data from the devices and actually produce an outcome. Safer cars, lower insurance rates, 
just as long as they don't start sending me emails and tickets because I was driving too fast, I think I'll be okay. Someone got the joke. So, so let's continue moving on. Let's get the energy going again. Are you guys excited today? Yeah. Try that one more time. Are you excited today? Yeah. All right. With that energy, let me introduce to you uh, our chief product officer here at Pentaho, Donna Perlick. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Now we're going to get the energy going. You guys, you guys, many of you who know me, we're going to get fired up now, right? Right? We're all fired up. It's Pentaho World. So I got to tell you, I really missed having this this last year. For those of you, just give a quick, quick clap or applause if you were here in 2015. Woo! Yeah. So it's great to have everybody back. My first question is, What's the word of the day? Anybody know? Yes? That's, number, that's a good one. Another one? Transformation. Yes, we have heard a lot about transformation. And when we were thinking about the theme for Pentaho World, we said, gee, in 2015, we were putting our data to work. Got a lot of good outcomes. You know, the customers in this room, I know, you guys have been measuring outcomes. Had a lot of success. Probably some trials and tribulations along the way, but a lot of success. So we said, gee, well, what's, what's coming next? Well, we're kind of moving past that. Things are disrupting. We're going to transformation now. So it was a great theme. We heard this morning from Brian talking about Hitachi Vantara is all about transformation, how the world is changing, data is changing, our businesses are changing, business models are blowing up all over the place. And so we're going to have to think a little bit differently. And then Brian talked about speed, agility, flexibility, all the things that we're going to need to be able to survive. And Ella, man, what a great, what a great story, right? That was amazing. I love, I love listening to Ella as well as just, I, as many of you maybe know, I love that story of IMS. It's such a great story of kind of the power of machine-generated data and analytics. And so we moved through that, and it's like, well, gee, let's think about that. We talked a lot about transformation, but what are some other shapes that transformation can take? Well, what if you thought about somebody handed you $10 billion and said, can you figure out how to get service, internet service, to people that don't have it or areas that don't have it? That'd be pretty transformative, right? And then you might think, well, let's think about something completely differently. Let's, let's go to a totally different industry. Think about manufacturing. And we all know that manufacturing floors have become much more automated over the last several years. So what about if you could start to not just think about using a factory floor and automating it to prevent defects, but what if you could deliver a better quality product? That'd be pretty cool. And as we learned, you know, what's really going to drive a lot of our experiences with different businesses is how do they make us feel? Do we feel like the product's good? Does it have good quality? So along with preventing defects and saying, okay, we prevented something from break, breaking, we also want that product to be great. That'd be pretty transformative. And then if you just go to the basics of life every day, we have states and governments that are trying to manage money and do things that are transformative, and they have data all over in silos. And you know, I have to admit that I do remember mainframes. I can say COBOL with a straight face, which probably not very many of you can, but maybe you can, I don't know. Um, there's data siloed all over the place. Mainframes are still out there, right? So data is not in one simple place. It's going to be easy. We're just going to throw it all into a big data lake, and everything's going to be great. These are transformation. These are transformative outcomes. Now, the cool thing is these are Pentaho customers. So when we think about this big, booming word out there of transformation, this is something that we've already been doing with you. We've been on this journey with you. This is not something that's new, transforming. So USA, USA uh, see, they are basically the designated uh, organization for that the FCC has said, look, you are going to be given $10 billion to bring service to areas that don't have it so that kids in school can do their homework, so that if we have IoT applications, there's some service somewhere that we can actually connect and capture data from. We've got Hyasung, who's probably out here, I think, somewhere. Um, 
tire manufacturer that does all the nylon cords that are in tires. Imagine if you could start to instrument and capture data from your factory floor to start to improve the quality, what that would do for your business. And then the state of Louisiana, five million people, and they're saving about ten, tens of millions of dollars every year now because they figured out how to take a completely outdated siloed infrastructure of data and turn it into a modern data infrastructure where now they can get the funds to different constituencies in their state much faster and also save money. Really super transformative outcomes. These are Pentaho Excellence nominees this year too. So let's give them a big hand for what they're doing. And so as I said, we've been on this journey. We've been on this journey with you guys and we've had a single kind of consistent vision for the product. Whether it was 13 years ago, as Anthony DeShazer said, when you, know, you had a bunch of great guys sitting around figuring out what we do with open source technology, it was still about data and analytics. It wasn't just about analytics, and it wasn't just about data integration. They understood that the complexity of solving data challenges has to go with the analytics. And so the vision has been that from data engineering to data prep to analytics, that has to be thought about as a single flow. If it isn't, something breaks along the way, and either your business outcome isn't going to happen because you're not looking at the data that's going to actually solve for the analytic insight. It's really important. The other piece that's hard is if you think about that whole pipeline of data, you also have to think about all the administration. How do you keep it secure? How do you do things like monitoring? What about multi-tenancy? And so those are the really hard challenges that sit kind of across that pipeline. And so when we look at the roadmap at Pentaho, we, we basically think about three key areas where we need to invest. The first is in a visual data experience, and that is either whether you've got data that is sitting, you're going to be able to deliver data to a dashboard or some type of analytic view in an application, or what Pentaho has been working on since release 7.0 what about if we brought that analytic experience into the data preparation and we could actually let you prepare your data and visualize it as you go? Imagine the time that that saves from IT to the business. And we hear that over and over and over in talking with customers. I hear it very often. It just takes too long. It takes too long to get the data to the business. And so if we can work to shorten that cycle, that starts to become transformative. The second area is in big data processing. And I have to admit, 2010, I, I learned about Hadoop. And I'm such a kind of nerd in that way. I was like, this is so cool. Because I had known BI, and then I was like, wow, and now we're going to have all this data. So we had to pay attention to Hadoop, and then MapReduce, and then Spark. And now whatever's coming next. Lots of things on the horizon. And so those are the areas around big data processing that we have to always be on top of so that when you're ready for those technologies, we're ready. And then lastly, that enterprise platform. As I mentioned, that's the stuff that's really hard. You know, those are the things that aren't always the most flashy on the outside, but if you're not thinking about how are we going to scale, how are we going to manage the data across this enterprise, it's hard. And so those are the things that we want to make sure we're investing in so that even if we get from the data to the insight, if we can't tell you what happened from here to there, or we're not being able to administer that, then we're not really doing our job. What's the great news? So we're Hitachi Vantara now, right? Which we're all kind of getting used to saying that. It's like Vantara, Vantara, Vantara. Uh, but so if I think about from a product perspective, what's, what's exciting to me is we now are part of this bigger portfolio of products. And it starts with storage, which we all know Hitachi has storage. But the cool thing is, as Brian said, there's metadata. And Hitachi brings content platforms and object stores and the ability to index and search on data and things that add to that analytic environment that we can help bring into your organization. So that's an area where we will see a lot of improvements in the platform relative to, to storage and content. The second piece is around services. So when I mentioned that data pipeline, all of the things you have to do to manage that data pipeline, whether it's <clears throat> monitoring, security. With Hitachi Vantara, they're building out a platform of services to be able to do that. 
all the things that Pentaho provides plus others. And so we're going to be able to leverage some of those services as part of our Pentaho platform, which will make our, pro our product more enterprise ready. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute when we get to the fun stuff. But um, edge processing to asset management, those are things around IoT that even if you're not ready today, you will have to deal with edge analytics, data at the edge. You're going to have to manage assets or things, devices, your phone, whatever it is. And so we'll be prepared because that's an area where Hitachi Vantara is investing. And then, of course, Pentaho. You know, Brian mentioned that we're really kind of the cornerstone of this whole data-driven organization. And so the things that we've done so well for so many years, data integration, analytics, that's still going to continue to be what Pentaho, the Pentaho platform has to do well. It's going to take a much bigger, broader shape over the next few years, but that's an area where we bring so much value because even if you can get that data at the edge or you can store it or you've got all these other capabilities, if you can't do the complex data integration and you can't deliver the insights, well, there's not a whole lot of value. And then applications. You can imagine, and many of you, our customers, are already doing this, right? You're building applications on top of Pentaho. So we're going to have the ability to do more of that. So really exciting stuff from a product perspective. I look at it and go, wow, our whole candy store just got a lot bigger, which is great. So now the fun stuff. So who's fired up for something fun? 8.0. Did you guys see it? All right. So Pentaho 8.0, exciting, a major release, but it's our first release as Hitachi Vantara, which is kind of cool because it's the same product and the same platform and the same brand on the product, but we're now a new company. So exciting stuff. And when we looked at this release, it's a great release, by the way. You can see it in the showcase. There's presentations. So there's Meet the Experts. I, I encourage you to go and talk with all the folks, myself, there'll be roadmap sessions and find out more. But we looked at three challenges. One, data volumes and velocity. So we all know about the whole volumes of data, blah, blah, blah. We've all seen the curve for the last five years. But the other piece is the velocity, that it's moving faster. And so in this release, we said, we need to make sure that we're broadening the connectivity to streaming data sources. So that includes Spark Streaming, the ability to connect to a Kafka stream, as well as uh, Knox Gateway, to be able to connect to a Knox Gateway. So those are the three things in that area, and I'm going to go real high level, but you'll be able to drill into those. The second one is all around managing resources, processing and storage resources. And we're all constrained by resources, ourselves included. Time, capacity. I know I don't have enough time in my day. I don't know about you. but um, So what we said is, gee, we did a great job in 7.0, 7.1, with the adaptive execution layer, and allowing customers to scale up where they needed to and execute either in the Spark, up in, on the Spark engine via a Pentaho transformation or the PDI engine. And so what we did in this release is we made that easier to use. We put some new capabilities in and we basically went, said, Let's put, we got to have it on Cloudera and we got to have Hortonworks and more to come. The second piece, which is really cool, is scaling out. So this concept of worker nodes where I just want to add some more nodes. I need more capacity. Can I add more? And so how we did that was we collaborated with the folks inside of Hitachi and that services platform I mentioned. There's something called Foundry. We took advantage of that. So we said, gee, we could do this on our own, but actually these guys have done some really cool work. And it'll make our work better. And it'll make it more appropriate for the enterprises we go into. And so that was a great first step in terms of where we're collaborating on the platform as Hitachi Vantara. And then lastly, the hard problem we're always trying to solve. How do we get less time, how do we have less time spent on preparing data? And so investing in that visual data experience to bridge that gap between IT and the business and the time that it takes to deliver data, but also to just remove some of the time it takes every day to prepare data. You have a lot of resources. Some of them are expensive. Data scientists don't come cheap. You want them doing the data science. You don't want them preparing data. So we'll continue to invest there. So super excited. Lots of fun stuff going on. Transformation, Pentaho 8.0. 
As we go into this with you, as I said, you saw the customers we have. They're just a small sampling of all the cool outcomes that we see in your businesses. So as we move from data to better outcomes, we're gonna keep moving with you on that journey and Hitachi Vantara, in terms of the resources and who we are now as a company, we'll be able to do a lot more of that. So thank you. And now, we get to move to something even more fun. So technology. All the technologies that are driving a lot of this transformation, there's really three, and there's something we call internally the power of three. IoT, big data, predictive analytics. They all have kind of converged and they all kind of have created the ability to do a lot of the transformative things that you're seeing, like what IMS is doing. And so what we decided to do is, hey, let's have a cool discussion. Let's bring out three experts who know a lot about these topics, one on each topic, and let's have a little conversation. So you can help me welcome them to the stage first is a senior analyst from Wikibon, James Kabelius. <laughs> Welcome, James. Thank you. Have a seat. Uh, second, we're gonna bring back Ella Halal, who is the Director of Innovation at IMS. So Ella, welcome back. And lastly, especially the Pentaho folks, you gotta really give it up here, come on. Pentaho, senior data mining consultant, otherwise known as the machine learning guru of all time at Pentaho, Mark Hall. I probably couldn't have embarrassed Mark more. <laughs> all right, so let's have a seat, guys. All right, we had a fun time yesterday talking, yeah. didn't we? We had to rehearse this, and they were basically like, get off the stage because you're talking too long. So. We said all our good stuff yesterday, so <laughs> know, you're so just yeah. getting our remainder. You might have to lower you know. your bar. It was really fun yesterday. So one of the things that, you know, in this power of three is bringing these three technology areas together. I mean, when you see that, what do you think has caused the convergence of those three areas of technology? What do you think some of the causes of that, those being able to be available to us today? I think mobile devices are very important. Smartphones, the fact that everybody's got them now and smartphones are essentially the, 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 the beachhead for the Internet of Things in, in our lives. And smartphones are both a massive uh, generator of data and a, a mass, increasingly a massive consumer thereof. Um, and really much of what we do with smartphones involves Things that were, uh, depend increasingly on predictive analytics to be in line to like e-commerce and so forth uh, to drive uh, you know targeted offers and next best actions and so forth. So I really think it's the the mobility revolution that's driving the convergence of these three technologies. Yeah, I second that. I think also the big advances that you can see in the IoT space, the ubiquitous um, sensors that are everywhere, the availability of huge data set as well as the advancement in processing power enables us to do a lot more than what we were, what was able to be done um, years back. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you know, as Ella was saying. The vast amounts of data being generated has really enabled certain machine learning and predictive techniques to really shine today. I mean, some of them have been around for many years, but the uh, paucity of data, the unavailability of data, the inability to store data at a granularity that could leverage those algorithms is only now being realized today. Yeah, I was thinking about that because, you know, as I was mentioning Hadoop from 2010, you know, that, I guess that's really as the big file system, right? Or the big file cabinet, as we sometimes used to call it. <laughs> that really allowed us to just accumulate those massive amounts of data, right? So I'm yeah. guessing that changed things significantly. Yeah, well, it's not just Hadoop, but of course the entire NoSQL <laughs> universe yep. of you know, distributed file stores, key value stores, graph databases, the, the proliferation of optimized data storage and processing platforms for the disparate range of data types, you know, including machine data. That, of course, is the foundation for the Internet of Things, so yeah. So the whole notion of a data lake, clearly, is like, we're just sitting here in central Florida, which is lake land, you're, you're flying in, you're seeing all these disparate lakes of different you know, shapes and sizes and so forth, so 
you have to think of the whole big data universe as like lake land, you know, just it's like an archipelago of lakes. Yeah. But I also want to tie it back to the advancement in the, um, whether it's the machine learning or the processing power that will enable it, uh, are, are key, right? Because mm -hmm. without them, we can't mine this huge data. The availability mm -hmm. of data itself is not enough, but the techniques and the ability to mine it, understanding, and pull the useful insight of it is, is a key. Yeah. Massively parallel processing power in the cloud is critically important for this revolution, as we know. Right, GPU processing, uh, dedicated AI chips have really enabled things like deep learning to come to the forefront today. Yeah. And you know, at Wikibon, we're seeing the whole deep learning chipset space is just like booming right now in terms of VCs, in terms of chip manufacturers. You got Nvidia, and you got Intel, and you got Google with their TPUs. Like this is uh, like an amazingly fertile space that we're watching day by day because the, the 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 architecture systems on a chip involving more densely packed, you know, tensor core processing units and so forth. These uh, uh, next year and beyond. I mean, we're just going to see this uh, explode where every, every device of any sort will have embedded chipsets that are optimized for deep learning and then the algorithms are gonna live on the edge, on the edge devices to enable, if not completely autonomous operations, semi-autonomous or uh, you know, cooperative uh, sort of uh, intelligence in the cloud, in like Brian Hopkins' great uh, presentation in the gateway, and on the edge devices to play together as part of a unified intelligence fabric. And the chipsets are critically important. So that's a, that's a good segue. Commodity and low power. That's a good local. segue thinking about that unified, you know, using the word unified and this great flow and everything. But that all sounds great. But what, what do you see as kind of the complexities or some of the barriers to actually you know, sort of the next uh, set of outcomes we might see based on these technology areas? Hmm. So there are, there are barriers around talent, obviously. Um, you know, all three of these technologies require certain skill sets, and there are advanced skill sets. So, you know, there is a shortage uh, of people have, who have skills in all three areas, I would say, in order to leverage all, all three of these technologies. There are also sort of um, barriers around the organization as well. So, uh, you know, the need, real need for a data culture within renowned organizations to allow data to be shared between different departments, um, to really be able to put data at the forefront so that people have access to it when they need it, how they need it, and so forth. I mean, these sort of things uh, are, are challenges for organizations to address. I would like, I second you, and I would like to add to that. The, pro the problem that I'm seeing from my point of view is that most of the techniques available today are designed and made for supervised learning. And when you come to work with real world data, it's messy, it's noisy, and definitely it's unsupervised. So this puts a lot of challenge, and this is, can tie back right away to the lack of the skills, because this is not all, a straightforward application. It's now you need somebody that has an understanding of the noise models, an understanding of the complexities, as well as somebody who can work with these unsupervised techniques to pull useful insights out of them. So this is another thing that uh, I've seen in the market as a bigger challenge. Yeah, related to that, related back to supervised learning as the core of, of what machine learning and deep learning and AI are, are all about in terms of practical applications. One of the barriers is simply, for many developers, is you know, where do you acquire the training data sets that you need? Um, how do you label them? How can you find resources, human beings and otherwise, to label the training data that you might need to be able to build and uh, optimize and refine your machine learning models? So how do you build an end-to-end um, uh, uh, pipeline, really a DevOps pipeline that can you know, acquire the right data that you need, can you know, do the labeling, can, can assist you with uh, uh, building and, uh, and, and iterating and scoring uh, your machine learning models, pushing them out, evaluating them. This entire release you know, pi pipeline, much of it depends on training data, and more of that's going to be auto-generated uh, going forward. But you know what? The question that I have is, does it have to be labeled data? Can we work on our machine learning techniques to transcend from a supervised learning to a semi-supervised or unsupervised learning? Because when we talk about the data sets that we're talking about with these sizes, with 
like hundreds of terabytes, even petabytes. Now we talk about it's very hard to label. Even if you have one million Amazon Turk people working, clicking, and labeling, it's still very hard to do. So I think we need to push the boundaries. And I think this is one of the challenges, is that how can we push the boundaries beyond the labeled uh, supervised approaches to be able to pull useful insights from an unlabeled data that is real world noisy data. And this is how our brains work. So our brains take this on this, this messy data and it is able to process and understand. So now if we're pushing the boundaries of AI, of machine learning and of data analytics, I think the next challenge would be can we get these systems to work with these, right. with similar data sets? The solution, well, solutions are, are several. Like you've indicated, more of a focus increasingly on unstructured learning, uh, unsupervised learning, but also semi-supervised, yeah. but also reinforcement learning. So more and more of what we see in terms yeah. of robotics and self-driving vehicles and consumer appliances is robots of various sorts where there's no ground truth or there's no training data. Or more to the point, you're not minimizing a loss function, you're maximizing a reward function. And build bots and build algorithms that uh, enable the, the edge device to learn for itself what path through some complex environment maximizes whatever reward function it might be relevant to its domain. I think that's Yeah, a, absolutely. I think we'll see more advances in streaming mining algorithms, basically. I mean, that's a field that's been around for a little while now. But um, there is a lot of potential there. So especially when you've got your edge devices with limited resources, limited RAM, limited storage, right? You want to be able to filter some data at that point so that you can get salient information being transmitted back to your central servers or whatever for you know, more heavier processing. But the streaming algorithms have to operate in these, these limited resource environments. So you know, advances in unsupervised techniques, semi-supervised techniques that can uh, operate in an anytime fashion on the fly without requiring storage, um, I, I think is a very interesting area. I totally second that. But that also brings another challenge, is that the availability of bandwidth for, for the streaming data, mm -hmm. because from an IoT perspective, you can get the sensors to collect data at 100 hertz or even higher. But then the cost of streaming it back for analysis is quite high. So I, I second what Mark said, the combination between like an analysis and filtering on the edge device or on the node itself, as well as streaming it back can help with the cost a little bit. However, the costs are still very high yeah. for it to be practical. I agree. So I think with the bandwidth constraints out to the edge will uh, cause more developers of, uh, of, of AI to use federated training where the edge devices are not sending back or streaming back every bit of data that they gather to the cloud for you know, processing or incorporation into a data lake, but rather will send back summaries of the data that they're seeing, filtered summaries back to you know, more of a central node that does the ongoing you know, training and validation, whatever, and iteration through, through the models. So we're seeing in the industry various efforts to, towards uh, you know, bringing more of a federated approach into to distributed training. We see a little bit of Google doing that. I think some IBM is doing some of that and so forth. I think that will expand. I think the, though that's federated training is not really the way most supervised learning um, in, uh, practices operate now. I think it has to become a more substantial focus of IoT, cogn cognitive IoT uh, algorithmic training going forward. But I think also with the advances of 5G as well as the other advances in telecommunication will help a little bit offset that issue too. So it would be a combination between all of these that will help. So. Right. Well, it certainly sounds like we've got a lot of challenges ahead. <laughs> a lot of opportunity, as it always is, right? They always go together. So one of the things that might be interesting for, for the folks in, is to understand from your perspectives, if you think about two to three to five years from now, you know, what are the, some of the outcomes that you think are sort of pie in the sky, but you know, maybe kind of interesting possibilities of what, what might come? We had a great conversation about this yesterday and you know, got into some of the, yeah, great outcomes at what price, but I'm just curious, you, know, to, you guys could share some of what you see, see ahead in terms of those outcomes. Something as mundane as uh, the, the death of passwords. 
through Face ID and similar you know, initiatives, Apple's already got it in this next yeah. generation smartphone. And that obviously depends on face recognition, which depends on machine learning and deep learning. And then you know, Google's bringing that into Android. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of those mundane things in terms of multi-factor authentication available to us. You know, as we use mobile devices for in every sphere of our lives, both consumer, personal, and, and business, and so forth, I think uh, multi-factor and biometric authentication of that nature of a very strong, uh, uh, very strong uh, multi-factor is coming to every application very, very quickly, and that's disruptive. In the sense, when I think of disruptions, I you know I think of. The, the greatest disruptions are those that simplify our lives and take things out that are unnecessary. Like passwords are increasingly unnecessary. Yeah. I know I would do a lot less. I lost my password. Please send me it again. <laughs> if that were the case. It would give me a lot of time back. So yep. I'll get the new Apple products, I guess, all of them at once. So, Any thoughts, Mark? I, I, you know, I fully anticipate being made completely redundant in my household by digital <laughs> assistants, you know, personal assistants, smart devices, you know, the advent of the smart lawnmower, and there really won't be any reason for me to exist, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> you have to find something else to do with your time, Mark. <laughs> I, I think the biggest advances would be in the area of enabling convenience for the end user because this is the big demand now. This is what we're living and breathing uh, with the computing around us would help enable this convenience. We need stuff faster. We need to be more productive. And we're actually more selective nowadays on where we spend our time. Mm -hmm. So the technologies that would be um, advancing and the ones that would be adopted are the ones that would help enable this convenience, whether it's from a password that will disappear or from low mower that will cut the lawn and hopefully something that will do the dishes and feed me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and it kind of ties to that customer experience, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it is around, obviously started with the big data and our ability to sort of capture lots of things about what we do in our lives, whether it's you know, where we are, where we shop, where we go. And so it'll just sort of be the next but, but this phase is also of that. This is also what's driving the autonomous vehicle, if you think about it, because the biggest advantage of autonomous vehicles is not just you sitting, not, not driving, it's you gaining that time back, the 4.5 years mm. back to your life, whether you're doing some work or spending some time with your family or even using your vehicle for productivity. Like uh, we all heard about like the fridge that will see what's missing in the fridge and they'll send your car to pick it up and you don't have to do this trip anymore. And I know that that might be far-fetched, but this is the direction where most companies are working on, enabling convenience, enable a better user experience at them. And you know, one of the things that I started with a sort of a mundane example of, how, of a disruption, which is the death of passwords, but something that really uh, excites me as a human being is the, is the growth of generative applications that depend on machine learning and deep learning and they're coming fast into every sphere of our lives. Natural language generation, NLG, is one of the beachheads for deep learning in the entire web, the, the whole web content management space. More and more articles, like news articles, are being written by bots, essentially, and that are trained to be about as good a writer as, as, a, as a good human is. We're going to see more NLG incorporated into every application of every sort that people use the, to generate content in all contexts. That's, that's a generative application that depends on deep learning DL, but also things like the next generation music composition workbench is DL enabled. I mean, we're seeing more music that's being composed by DL, essentially. I think over, you know, whether you, it's good music or not is a secondary issue or whatever, depending on your point of view. But it's like, it's the new, it's the new Moog synthesizer for the 21st century, essentially. Yeah. There'll be new expressive possibilities there, but also more visual art is being created by deep learning and machine learning using style transfer, take techniques and so forth. Those are coming into the mainstream of creator or maker culture in every sphere. And we're going to see a fair amount of generative applications and things that, like in cinema and so forth uh, take off in a major way. But that's all, you know, that's all you know, machine learning, deep learning, big data um, or under the covers. Yeah. So I think the other thing, too, would be moving away from narrow AI, which ties back to what you're saying. So it's 
creativity in AI, but it's not only creativity in AI, it's moving away from narrow AI. AI that we have today is very, very good in doing one specific thing, the thing that you trained your model for. <clears throat> but if we move away, hopefully in the future, into wider AI, it's gonna be, gonna be similar to human intelligence. You mm. can be intelligent in multiple things at the same time, whether it's not, uh, natural uh, language processing, vision, you're good in multiple things. And hopefully in the future, the AI, we are able to train we don't have even to train. Hopefully our AI, the models that will be built or it will self-train even, will be able to work on multiple things mm -hmm. together. And that in fact is a hot research focus in the AI community called transfer, transfer learning. learning. Oh yeah, of course. Transferring knowledge from one task to the next. In fact, the Open AI Consortium has a, essentially a testbed network for developers to come and, and, and you know, improve their, their techniques and approaches for, for transfer learning. But the problem so. with transfer learning to date is that if it's a, a vision system trained, yeah. it will be applied in different things, but it needs to be a vision system. Yeah. You cannot train a vision system to put it in language. The, wide, the definition of wide AI is that it can do vision, whatever you're training it for, and then it can do language, and it can do music, and it can do multiple things. The applications are following money. I think a lot of what I see in transfer learning is helping, you know, if, you've, if you've aced one online multi-user game, that you can transfer your knowledge of how to ace that game to other online games and so forth. I mean, I've, I've, I'm seeing a fair bit of that going on. It's still within the same domain, but yeah. I, I think, um, you know, wide AI, as you're talking about, is is a bit further than two or three years out. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, much further. Yeah. So, so to that and we were talking about yesterday, all these great outcomes and fascinating things <laughs> around music and art and that. And then we talked a little bit about the dark side. Um, you know, that there could be some potentially Ooh. dark sides to the, um, well, we need a little dramatic effect, right? <laughs> a little bit of a dark side to I need a robot overlord costume to wear for Halloween this year. Everybody <laughs> got a good one or Okay, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Where are you going to be on Halloween? Yeah. Probably at my home handing out candy. Okay, good. <laughs> I won't be there. I don't want to see the robot costume. Okay. It kind of scares me a little bit. But, um, in any event, we've got um, the dark side. Perfect robot costume. <laughs> you know, what are some of the things we talked about the other day about who's responsible for the, for the models? Who's respons Remember we were talking about that last night. Like, who's, who's actually responsible? Is it the data? Who does it end with? So, you know, Mark, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. We, we were... Well, I mean, yeah, it's a thorny topic, right? You know, yeah, <laughs> I you think. have models, you have data, you have the data scientists that are, you know, produce the models from the data, and then you have something go wrong down the track. Well, you know, who do you point the finger at? <laughs> um, so, I mean, that, that's a tricky question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, we talked yesterday about it and we were talking about um, the EU declaration about responsible innovation and the fact that there is a global awareness of uh, the concept of responsible innovation, which is you're trying to incorporate in whatever systems that you're developing the concepts, the morals, and the ethics of, of us humans. Because we are living in our modern society and we're all governed, regardless of laws, by some morals and ethics of how human interacts with each other. And now when you bring in this, hopefully in far future, <laughs> this wide AI that can read, understand, and make decisions on our behalf, whether it's autonomous vehicles or others, how will it function? How will, um, how will it operate? And when it gets in front of a moral dilemma, how will it take the decision? And I think you were talking about this example of car <laughs> crashing somebody. Yeah, that's the typical uh, you know, scare example that is, is used. You know, if an autonomous vehicle can't help but hit either one group of humans or another, which decision does it make? Uh, or should it make any decision? <laughs> that has to be, those, every, every possible, possible outcome on, in some way has to be sort of coded or into the full framework for development of that model. Um, and uh, who makes that decision? I mean, uh, how to code it? And who takes responsibility for the inevitable outcome, or for whatever outcome? But, but all these systems have the problem of the many hands. So it's not one person who's developing this code to be responsible. Not that person who would explicitly say, if you see two people here and one people here, hit the one person versus <laughs> the two. It's, it's, not gonna, it's never gonna be coded like that. And this is another problem in responsible innovation is that how can we 
as developers of the technology, as people working within technology, embed our moral ethics and moral responsibility into these systems. Because it's not gonna be what if condition, because you can never code every combination out there, but you can code a foundational code of ethics on how it should behave. And yeah. So as you know, as the speaker said this morning, your data lives forever and it will outlive the systems upon which it was created. Likewise, your algorithms will live essentially forever. They'll outlive the actual developers who put them together and train them. Train them initially and they'll be yeah. retrained and so forth. You know, the organization that uh, builds and uh, and and you know and deploys uh, that all of that into various applications accepts responsibility on the level of they own the algorithms or they own the data and so forth. So, I mean, I, I am not a lawyer, but but you know, that's clearly, an assumption. That's an assumption that one organization is developing. But now you have the problem of open source. So we, this morning we were talking about open source. Now who takes the responsibility? Yeah. But I think, uh, like at least that's my personal recommendation, if we think about responsible innovation, if we think about the code of ethics that governs us as human beings, and this is the core of every like, super wide AI system would be the, with the same rules, then it might help us um, with a better chance of having systems that are morally sound. If we can't, if we can't you know, completely indemnify ourselves against artificial stupidity, what we do need, however, is tools to lay bare the algorithmic workings of whatever it is that, that did something horrible so that when it ultimately gets uh, litigated, um, that at least there's full discovery of the, the, the wow. exact chain of things that happened to put a particular algorithm in place at a particular time with particular data coming in from particular sensors to drive a particular algorithm. So in other words, for if, if there's a judge or a jury in the universe that really wants to slog through all that crap, they can do so because we give them the tools to easily roll up a narrative though it might be the most complex well, narrative like, on earth. It certainly sounds like we have no shortage of challenges. Oh, yeah. it make it, it'll be a narrative that makes as much sense as James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake does. You know, I'm sure the it. car will get you to sign a waiver exactly. before you step inside. <laughs> yeah, that's right, sign a waiver. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, and I know that all of you have uh, sessions coming up. So James, you have one. Uh, right after this, I run over to theCUBE. I'll be co-hosting theCUBE today and right. tomorrow. Okay, of course. And then I have a session tomorrow morning. I believe it's 10.30 on um, AI and pushing AI to the edge. Um, All right, so. so if people want to learn more, they can attend. And I think you have one. Yeah, I have one today at uh, uh, 5.30. Okay. Um, Great. Customer showcase. And Mark, I know you have some. You're yeah, I have a talk this afternoon at half past two on Spark ML Lib in Weka. Great. I know your sessions are always fascinating for our uh, Pentaho World crowds here, and you guys all uh, always uh, add. We love, you know, we obviously love all the customer presentations and the. I've known you guys for industry. quite a while. Yes, it's you great have. to see how you've evolved. Hitachi yeah. Ventara, great. Yeah. And thanks yeah. for having us. So thanks so much for uh, you know spending the time and and uh, talking about an obviously interesting and we got into a very controversial topic at a certain <laughs> point. So thanks so much. We'll, uh... All right, all right, all right. Our crew is going to head off here. Great, I'll just have two. <laughs> Did you enjoy that panel? I like the, the, I'll just say, creative tension that was caused there. Uh, artificial stupidity is the first time I've heard that term. I think I'm going to go buy that domain name, artificialstupidity.com. So, listen. All right, guys. Thank you for this morning. Uh, we've, we've gone through a lot. You've heard from a lot of great speakers. You've heard what the purpose is for this particular session. What's next? How do you take what you heard today and bring it down so you can execute on it. Well, we have breakout sessions. This is where you can learn from some of the best thinkers we have, both within Pentaho, within Hitachi Ventara, and from our partners. They can show you or talk to you about the right strategies, the right techniques, the best practices for accomplishing your outcomes, for achieving your outcomes. We have the Solution Expo. Wonderful opportunity just to go and network with other customers, other partners, even with Pentaho employees, Ventara employees, to learn what we're doing. 
Form those right connections that can always be helpful for you in the long run. And of course, we have Meet the Experts. I was backstage in the green room just basically chilling, you know, just relaxing, because I had it all to myself. And, and there are people still scheduling Meet the Expert sessions. We still have time, we still have slots. If you have any issue that you want to deal with, we can absolutely help you out there. I personally am signing up for, to help customers on some of those, so if you have an issue or have a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you desire, we have space in Meet the Experts. But the most important thing, no one responded. You guys hung over from last night? Is that what it is? Never mind. Uh, the most important thing for me is to have fun. We're here to celebrate, not just to learn, but also to celebrate. And we have a brocade tonight. Great craft beers, games, music. I already called dibs on Pac-Man. So someone, you're gonna have to beat me to get me off Pac-Man. But let's have fun tonight. Let's network, let's get to know each other so that we can partner for the transformation you need in your company. Are you ready to transform? Yeah. I ask this again. Are you ready to transform? Yeah. Then let's go do it. Thank you. What you wanna do, baby?